Howdy hackers and welcome to another episode of Fairlight TV. It's been a long time. I'm humbly ashamed of that, but uh, I will try to kind of keep up with the regular release schedule at one episode a week. No promises, but I'm trying my best. I promise you that. Uh, there is something called life that has been sort of coming in the way of recording more and also uh, life includes hacking on the C64. And this time I have been hacking on cartridges and uh, cracking cartridges is something that we haven't gone through here. Um, we have done a lot of disc stuff and we have done a lot of tape stuff as well. but. Uh, yeah, there might be a reason to kind of go into cracking cartridges because uh, in all fairness, uh, I am rather experienced when it comes to messing with tape and also with disc, but with cartridges, less so. So uh, I will go through kind of two, two things here. Well, first, it will be a general discussion of cartridges uh, and a lot of background around like how cartridges work. Um, and these are like the normal game cartridges. And there is a reason to also look in how the RAM expansion unit works. It's, it's to you, it might be a cartridge, but it works very different compared to other cartridges. Uh, and, and after that is done, I will go through cracking a cartridge and also in the very end, go through how I would implement uh, a RAM expansion unit version of a game. So uh, if if the cart is cracked to work on RAM expansion, you would possibly think that that would be the same thing, but it's very much not. So stick with me until the end and we will go through all the cartridges. We will go through uh, cracking from cartridge and also how to make a RAM expansion unit version of a game. So let's go. All right. Um, there are a number of videos already available on the net on uh, on cartridges. So I will be very brief. Uh, down in the description, there will be a link to something called Retrobit. Uh, that is uh, or Retrobits. That is another YouTube show, and he's going through cartridges, the, like the standard cartridges, and he's doing that really good. So there is no reason for me to also do very much the same. So I would encourage you to listen to or watch the first part of that, because he's explaining cartridges, and then he's building a cartridge, and you can skip the building part, because that is not adding to the value of this. But... Uh, the basics is very well described and also all the visual effects are there and, and it's very graphical. So I would encourage you to, to have a look at that. But in general, uh, a cartridge is an 8K of memory that is mapped into the memory map of the Commodore 64. So it can be read by the CPU. And as you know, the CPU has a data bus of 8 bits, which means that it can read a byte at the time. It has an address bus of 16 bits, which means that it can address 64 kilobytes. And there is 64K of memory inside the computer. It cannot like be added like it's added on the VIC-20. Uh, it's, it's part of the address space, but there needs to be some sort of bank switching mechanism so that the cart memory is prioritized over the RAM that's already there. Or in some of the cases, it's, it's, it's mapped to the same location where you already have the basic ROM or the kernel ROM. And there again, you need bank switching to ensure that the cartridge ROM is prioritized and read uh, when the CPU is addressing it, rather than the RAM and rather than the basic and curler ROM. I, I think that is better explained in retro bits. So uh, again, I would like to advise you to have a look at that one. But uh, but in to be really brief, there are. There are basically two things that control this. First of all, the CPU is a 6510, uh, which is different from, C from the 6502, the standard 6502, only in one way. It has three pins which control bank switching. That one is connected to the PLA, um, which is the sort of memory management device here. 
And in addition to that, there are also two pins from the cartridge port connected to the PLA. Uh, so the the internal ones on the CPU, they are the low RAM, the high RAM, and the Sharn. Um, and the one from the cartridge port, they are called Game and XROM. And given these five pins, there are so many different combinations uh, of like memory configuration you can achieve by setting those to different values. Uh, and there is an excellent overview of this in uh, game base. Uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, code base. I will show you that one. All right, uh, let's go over to this screen. So this is code base 64. You have the address up here. Uh, this is how you manage the uh, low RAM, high RAM, and Charon, uh, and what they will achieve for you memory map wise. Uh, I've already gone through sort of memory mapping on the C64 in a previous episode, but the, the important part is this one with cartridges. Uh, so you can, the standard cartridge is 8K, but you can also have uh, 16K cartridges. And the first bank is always on 8,000. And the second one can be on 8,000 or it could be on E1000. The, the latter mode is called um, Ultimax. Uh, and that one is really cool because if you have the second bank going over the kernel, that means that you're actually capturing the, all the, the, the kernel vectors up on the very high memory. So FFFC is the, uh, the reset vector. Uh, so if you... If you have the cart memory mapped into there and you press the reset button, there is no way the computer can stop that in any way. And, and the same would be for an NMI. Uh, that's non-maskable interrupt. Uh, also, if you have your cartridge mapped into E1000 and you trigger an NMI, that will use the vector in that kernel ROM that you mapped in, which means that ba basically you make the the, the the running program defenseless against uh, against the cartridge kind of taking control over the machine and these are the functions used by by uh, freezer cartridges so that's what they use they use the ultimax mode so they have something mapped into e1000 and then the game cannot defend itself against that unless they sort of detect the cartridge and refuse to work if the ca cartridge was operational so I'm not going through all the details here, but uh, here you have the Ultimax mode where you have the ROM L uh, and the ROM high, um, and then uh, this is what happens. Um, right. I'm not going through the details. I would encourage you to read that yourself. Uh, it's probably better than I read this out loud, uh, but, it, but it is rather complex. So address zero one and the pins on the cartridge port determines the relevant memory configuration. Right. Okay, so now we're going through the 8K and 16K because uh, you saw here that you could you can ensure that you have 16K available and one bank is on 8000 and one of them is, is uh, available like an alternative to the basic ROM or an alternative to the kernel ROM. Uh, that's that's really handy, but if you have a game or, or any program which is bigger than 16K, you need an alternative mechanism to ensure that you would have sort of more space available in the cartridge. Uh, and the way to do this is the, the one sort of introduced in ocean, ocean cartridges. They added a register on DE100, so DE00. You poke that and then you determine banks. So the cartridge has additional logic for allowing more than 16K. So you basically change the memory that the cartridge exposes to the computer. So when the CPU then addresses the, uh, the exposed area on let's say 8,000, uh, there is a new bank there rather than sort of the, the first bank. So that is how cartridges could be bigger than the 16K. That is sort of the theoretical mac maximum if you use the standard mechanisms for, for addressing memory inside the cartridge. Um, 
Yeah, so, uh, and, and then in addition to that, you have even more complex cartridges that they expose a piece of RAM uh, at DE100 up until DFFF. That's two pages of memory. Some would have only one page uh, and they could be on different places. Or they have two pages. And then you also have like Action Replay and, and Super Snapshot and those. They have an additional 8K of memory that they can expose to 8000 as well. So they copy a little routine into the memory and then they can copy back and forth to that. Uh, which is absolutely needed for stuff like the freezer cartridge because if you have a freezer cartridge, you need to maintain all of the memory sort of untampered with. And the only way to do that is having a piece of RAM. So you copy stuff from the computer into this additional RAM that will leave you with workspace. So inside the computer RAM, you suddenly have stuff that is copied away somewhere else. And then you can work in the computer memory. And when you are restarting the program, you restore the, the copy from the cartridge RAM into the CPU RAM, and then you revert and leave the computer to run. And in the best of world, you would have done that so neatly that the program wouldn't even realize that somebody had been inside the code uh, working, taking full control of the computer for a period of time. Um, so. There are uh, like a, a number of complex cartridges and, and, and let's say Action Replay and um, uh, Super Snapshot are two of the kind of first really complex one that they used a, a lot of mechanisms, bank switching, uh, RAM ex uh, exposing RAM and also having this little little page on DE100. Uh, and, and if you look at sort of cartridges you can buy for the native C64 now, there are a number of cartridges available and they are emulating uh, sort of all of those techniques. So you could, you could populate them with a cartridge image uh, of like any sort and it will run it as if it was like the original hardware. Here you have stuff like Easy Flash now up and on version 3 I think. Uh, you have the Kung Fu Flash, you have the Sidekick 64, uh, I mean even Turbo Chameleon and Ultimate 1541 are also like that. You can populate them with basically any cart image and they work as if they were running using the sort of native hardware that they were distributed on originally. Uh, and, and given that this is giving you a deep uh, a deeper depth uh, a, a deeper info piece of information on an actual game that i have been hacking around with the game is uh, knights and slime and that one is distributed on an easy flash image that was sort of the the 1.0 and from 1.1 and 1.2 you also have like a, a real like ocean image um which is Slightly different. I, I guess the only difference is that it's not storing the progress into the ocean cartridge because they are not they, they are ROM only. Whereas the the Easy Flash itself has uh, has the ability, of course, to program the cartridge. Okay, let's have a little look at this game. So, Knights and Slimes is the game. Music is not too shabby, I must say. Right, so this game comes in, in two images, as I said before. Said before, the, uh, you could have the Easy Flash one, and there you store the uh, the progress inside uh, an area of the Easy Flash, so it, it maintains your progress. But it also has a system of passcode. So if you run this on uh, on the ocean image, and it, also if you run it uh, inside the C64, you know the little the little mini one and and also the maxi one, they seemingly don't support storage of. Uh... Yeah, so you cannot store the progress. You cannot program them that like that. So for that, there is a passcode system. 
and you select your guy and playing the game is pretty much the same regardless of which guy but uh, and we let's do 07 OA 03 I'll show you a bit of hacking wonder here did you see any difference yes you can suddenly select the last level as well yes that 07 OA opens the uh, that, that is the threshold for the levels you have available you need to conclude the, the first level you need to conclude all three levels uh, to be able to access that, but that is just a, a quick way to set that threshold to the maximum, and, and then you have that. Uh, yeah, let's uh, let's do another little hack here. Uh, o A O. I clear the level. So that is setting the uh, how many additional this little skull thing counter to zero. And when you set that to zero, uh, you have made the level because there are no additional skulls you are expected to pick up. Uh, so th that would be that would be reaching zero if you manage to kill all the slime on the level. So, but uh, that that was a quick way to achieve the uh, the killing of all the slimes. All right, uh, I won't bore you more with me playing the game because uh, I'm just showing the game as, as a sort of source of ref reference here. Okay, more on Easy Flash. So Easy Flash supports basically all of the things you could ever want to, uh, to emulate on a cartridge. So it has two hundred two five hundred and twelve kilobytes chips so think of them like uh, the low memory and the high memory the low memory is the one that always goes to 8000 the high one is the one that goes to a thousand or e thousand or if it's in 8k mode i guess you can have like the also the second bank be mapped to, uh, to 8000 but then it's then it's only there then there is no like secondary thing uh and uh, i mean the newer version or the newer <laughs> releases of the cartridge they th those reside inside the same chip so it's not actually two chips but but you can you can think of them like two chips if you read the instructions on how to code this uh, they are referencing addresses inside the cartridge using bank the the stuff you poke into de 100 and then there is uh, like a zero or one uh, which is the high, low or high bank, and then there is like an offset between zero, zero, uh, between zero and one F F F. So these are the two thousand byte, the eight K uh, that each of the banks could contain. So if you read the programming manual, that's how they are referencing them. Um, so and you select the bank using the six lowest bits of D E one hundred. Uh, DE02 you can use to kind of change the game and XROM and, and so the, the two pins, the memory configuration and you can also set the diode to play um, to on and off and, and there is sort of a best practice on using that. Uh, if the cartridge is off it should be, the, the light should also be off and if it's on it the, the diode should be on. And when you're loading or saving, they are suggesting that for every 256 bytes you write, you should blink once. Uh, yeah, okay. So, and, and if you obtain a cartridge file, like a CRT file, uh, they have the low bank and high bank sort of interleaved. So the first 8K is the first 8K of the low bank. And then you have the 8K of the high bank, and then you have the 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 next block of 8K in the in the low bank and the high bank, and interleaving such as that. So, if you don't find any reference to how the file format works, now you know that's how it works. Um, yes. Uh, the Easy Flash has has sort of one additional thing. First of all, it has uh, the little RAM that sits on DF one zero zero. 
I hope that's right. Yeah, it's it's DF00. Uh, that one is separated into two parts. Uh, the, the, the first hex 80 bytes, so 128 bytes, that is sort of, you can store whatever you want there. The lower part is, is a vector area that points to um, the Easy Flash API. And, and the Easy Flash API is sort of um, a programming library made so that you can access code functionality uh, for reading and writing to the Easy Flash. You don't need to kind of implement those routines yourself. You can you can set the position inside the cart, you can set the length of the transfer, and then you can initiate the transfer. That that saves a lot of code and, and it's always right because the Easy Flash would take care of that. The API would take care of that. But you need to have the part that I find a bit strange is that you basically need to copy that out. And um, so you 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 set the bank to bank zero and then you initiate a copy of the routine uh, so that that stays. Those three pages that is needed for this is copied into RAM. Um, you would imagine that it would be fully possible to have the, the little uh, vector pointing to a little routine that would also sit in that little RAM that would access stuff that is on the ROM rather than having like a copy in RAM, but that's not how it works. And and I don't know why they have done it like that. That That's sort of, for me, if you have a ROM, it's easier to use that ROM and, and execute it inside the ROM and then go back because you can do all the bank switching you want because the the D is accessible in, in most address modes anyway. But uh, yeah, that's not how it works. Um, and, and there is one little special thing that you should also remember. If you would like to store any progress inside the cartridge, um, you, sh you should think of it like a normal EPROM. Um, EPROMs that you stuff in cartridges, uh, you erase them first. Uh, the EE prom you could erase using UV light. So uh, everybody who programmed EEPROM back in the days had a UV lamp, and then you had your memories uh, inside uh, a little box that you had UV lights in. And then after a number of hours, they were erased. And erased means that all the memory was set to FF. So, or all the bits in all the memory was set to one. And then when you program them, you can set bits to zero. So if you would have like written zeros to a large portion of the cartridge, there was no way you could program that part. That was sort of not possible. You needed to erase it again and then write zeros to it. Uh, Easy Flash works basically the same way. So uh, you need to format an area. And, and when you do that, you set it to uh, FF, so you set all the ones, and then you can write to it. If you try to, uh, if you have an area which is not initialized and you try to write to it, you can just set uh, zeros to the places where there is one to start with. And if you have like random data, it's very unlikely that you will have a successful write. Because if you do that enough times, you would only have one, uh, sorry, zeros. The error would be totally full of zeros and it would be a total waste, even from the first time. So format, write, and then it's there. Um, yeah. I have no idea why it's doing that, but uh, but that's how it works. So this is everything I wanted to talk about when it comes to Easy Flash. There will be a reference to cartridges. There will be a reference to code base, uh, the one I already showed you, and there will be a reference also to uh, like a coder's manual to Easy Flash. All of these three, three references will be down in the link below. Uh, now we will go into something else, the RAM expansion unit, the 1700 or 1764 or whatever they were called, the Commodore, Commodore's own memory expansions. Okay, so these work totally different. The original cartridges, they, they had memory that was mapped into 
the uh, into the memory space. And the cool thing with that is that you could just it would be accessible. You could just flip the switch, having a bank on a re on on a, on a piece of uh, the memory, and then you can call the routine and it would execute just like that. That that's that's sort of the the benefit of this. You would have access to stuff inside the CPU addressing range instantly. Uh, the, the drawback is that if you would like the VIC to have access to it, you would need to copy it down to somewhere where VIC would read. Um, because as far as I know, you cannot like show content of the ROM to the VIC because the VIC wouldn't see it. So you would need to make a copy. And the CPU is rather slow when it comes to copying. So uh, a load ad uh, load accumulator instruction takes four cycle, a store takes four cycle. Uh, and then you probably want some sort of index since you would uh, do a load accumulator uh, ROM address comma X, and then you would store it to like uh, RAM address comma X, and then you would have a loop to do that, uh, or you would have two zero page addresses, with, which would be even slower. So, I mean, copying every single byte is at least 10 to 15 cycles, depending on the addressing mode that you are using. If you're doing it like a loop unrolling, the absolute fastest way you can do it is copying it using, uh, well, that would be two by uh, like eight cycles. Uh, but the the RAM expansion units they have something which is more like a blitter, uh, pretty much like the API actually of the Easy Flash. Even if the the API of the Easy Flash is doing a copy in the background, this is blitting from the RAM into computer memory. So you set the uh, registers for a transfer, <coughs> excuse me, and then you execute that, and then areas of the memory inside the RAM expansion unit is copied using a blitter functionality into the RAM of the computer. Uh, so the, the, the way this works is that it copies stuff, uh, and every byte takes only one CPU cycle. Okay, there, there is, of course, an overhead of setting uh, the, the transfer up. So if you're just copying one byte, it would be slower because the, the loading and storing of all the data would, would take more time than that. But if you're copying like a, a block of, of uh, several hundred bytes, it will be so much faster. And the cool thing here is that you can do a lot of tricks with this. And, and we will get to that in the very end. But... But let's just go through a few of the modes here. Uh, you can transfer from the 64 to the RAM expansion. Again, one cycle per byte. You can copy from the RAM expansion to the C64. Again, one cycle per byte. You can make a swap. So you, you take the C64 content and put it in the RAM expansion and, and vice versa. That actually takes two cycles for that because it's sort of reading and writing and, and both of them would take one cycle. And then you have a compare, uh, which is also handy for, for uh, I know a number of crunches I use this for, for finding strings inside, uh, inside the memory. Um, for that, that, the first crunches that were really fast by using the RAM expansion, use the compare function uh, to, to find substrings, right? So, uh, and um, you can have the registers count up, so you don't need to populate them, um, and uh, you can reset them or you can let them continue. These are parameters you can set when you set up your, your actual transfer here. Uh, you can, you can have the transfer start immediately, or you can delay it. Uh, and uh, one scenario where you might want to delay it is if you want to copy to under the I.O. area. So you can actually copy to D1000 to D DFFF. What you do then is uh, you set up um, the transfer, but you set up a delayed transfer, and then you swap 01, so you have access to RAM. And then you trigger that transfer 
and then memory is transferred directly to the area, which is like normally not accessible because you would have the I/O over. So, and and this the the trigger for that delay transfer is a write uh, instruction to FF00. And what you basically do is you load FF00 and then you write back because you, um, if that is an uh, a, a memory address you would like to retain. You can just just write any random value. So if you read the value it already has and you write it back, you trigger the transfer and you didn't trash any memory while doing so. Um, yes, and and I should also say that it's not like absolutely one cycle; it's one CPU cycle. Um, and if you look at how the C64 works, the VIC. So the video chip has precedent uh, in a number of scenarios. When it's drawing the screen, you have the thing called bad lines when it's when the VIC needs to read the pointer to the character memory. That takes 40 cycles uh, on, on each bad line. So every eight line, the first line on every like on, on every screen is is not available to the CPU because the VIC is using that. And also if you have sprites on top of your graphics, uh, on all lines where the sprite is shown, uh, that one also takes a number of cycles. And depending on the which sprites you're actually using, uh, they take different number of cycles. But uh, these are also eaten by the VIC and they are not available to the CPU. And if they're not available to the CPU, they're also not available to the RAM expansion unit uh, in performing its transfers. Okay, uh, there are a number of cool things you could do with this. Uh, and uh, this is also described rather well in, in one of the code base articles. And I will just show you that code base. Okay, so here we have that one. It's it's about REM expansion unit programming, and uh, this is how you set it up and and how you execute the transfer. So these are the register, the DF one hundred and and onwards to DF OA, I think it is, uh, which you can use for or which you should use for for controlling the transfers between the RAM expansion unit and the CPU. Uh, and they are also uh, comparing this, uh, yes, uh, here, if you want to fill memory, you can have one byte, let's say you want to fill an area of this, of the computer, you can, you can set the counter as fixed in the RAM expansion unit and it counting up in the CPU, that's one of the modes you can do. Uh, and then you set the length for how long you would like that byte to be filled. So if you want to fill, zero fill, uh, a large memory area of the C64, you set uh, one byte in the RAM expansion unit to zero, and you set the RAM expansion unit address to fixed to that address, so not counting up, and then you set the start address in the 64, you set the length, and then you execute it. And then you would have that, like, zero filling the entire range that's absolutely going to be a lot faster than any copy routine or fill routine you can do with the c64 right yeah that's that's just one of the things and uh do read this article it, it's it's one of those uh code base 64 uh, articles that is very well written and gives you a very good insight of how stuff works Okay, so cracking uh, an easy flash game and and uh, knights and slimes is the particular game uh, in question here. Um, you need to extract the data from the cartridge, and and I've gone through my sort of general way of working. I have kick assembler doing a lot of the grunt work for me. Uh, when I extract something, I I store it in my structure inside the crack folder, and then I use 6502 bench for reassembly. Uh, and then I have uh, a, some file, which is a patch file, where I import the source, apply the patches, write it back, and then the process 
crunches that and and places on the placed it places it on the disk in, in the very end and when i'm done i have something which is fully working but but for this to work I need to know where to apply the patches, I need to know what patches to apply, and, and I also need to extract all the files that should be in the final release. So uh, I'll, I'll just show you a little thing here. Okay, so it's this. Here I, I generate a file called OA. The segment I'm using for this is the, the OA. Uh, and the segment here is uh, something on uh, which should have a start address at 8000. And then I import binary from uh, the Knights and Slimes uh, cartridge image. image. So I, I took the CRT, converted it to binary because I didn't want any header or anything. I, I could work with that as well, but it's a lot more convenient to be absolutely sure that if I want to read from the offset 2000 inside the image, I would like to read from offset 2000. I don't want to read from 2056 or whatever, how how long the, um, the header of the CRT image is. I, I don't care about that. I want the raw binary data. So this is, uh, yeah, I'm... <laughs> It's doing the same here. It, it's it's all doing the same. I am extracting uh, 2000 hex 2000 bytes of data from the start. So this is indicating the start of the the binary image, and uh, that chunk of data is stored as that file name. It's that easy. Just executing this, it's just an assembly. It's it's basically doing an extraction. It has nothing to do with assembler here, but uh, but but the assembler could be used as a tool also for extracting data from a cartridge. So this is how I would have done it, or this is how how I actually did it. So the next question is. Uh, what naming convention are you supposed to use? Uh, because you need to implement something inside the game uh, which loads. So you're retrofitting the game uh, with a loader and uh, a depacker, preferably because you want the data to be on disk to be compressed. And uh, just this particular game, it uses two different mechanisms. Uh, one is mapping in a, a memory area and then just copy it out. So that's one. Uh, but it also has the functionality that, that chunks of the memory is compressed. So there is a depacker down on 0200. So it then maps in the relevant bank, set the start pointer, and then calls the depacker. And then, then that one depacks from the cartridge image to memory. Um, and and uh, so naming and, and how you should sort of basically structure your data is one thing. Uh, if a bank would only contain one file, you could use the bank name as the, the file name. That, that would be really convenient if you could do that. But the thing is here, um, in some of the banks, you basically have sever several segments. So uh, it banks in bank number five and then copies from this portion of the ROM or this portion of the ROM, or this portion of the ROM. Then that approach of having a file which has the name of the bank doesn't really work. You need to have a, like a different approach. Either you load in the entire bank, but then you need to have the, the memory area available uh, for uh, for loading the entire bank. It's a bit of a waste because if you're only if you're keen to kind of copy out a little portion of the bank, you load the entire bank and then just copy out a little portion. That means that you've loaded a lot of stuff, which is wasteful. That took a lot of time to load uh, for no apparent benefit. But on the other hand, if you want to have like several 
every segment of, of every bank into a separate file, you have a number of files and then you need to implement some sort of naming convention that you would have like bank and sub-segment index and then things becomes rather complex. So the, the approach I took was uh, <laughs> I wanted to prepare myself for an IFFL. So I had bank and then I mapped that to an index. Um, and I wouldn't recommend that. That's the approach I took from the from the start. So I had to follow through on that one. But it made a lot of uh, and it made a lot of sense initially. But uh, but it became too difficult basically. So it it took a lot of time just to keep track of which one has which which segment has which index. So I am loading the full eight k of of memory to that area and I allow the game to copy it uh, as it wants from that. That's what I'm doing for all the blocks uh, when it's mapping in an area and just copy it. The, the, the bigger files would be those where it's using the dcruncher. Those I save out using a different uh, file name, but, but I store them not uh, in, in the in the area where the ROM is visible, I, I store them so they end up directly where they're supposed to be. That way I could remove the dcruncher altogether uh, and I could just use my own dcruncher instead, uh, rather than like having duplicate dcruncher because that would also be a total waste, both of CPU time and, and also um, memory. Okay, so uh, is there any like best practice here or, or how? how people normally would do it. Well, I would suggest you use the bank index as a file name and, and, and work yourself from that. In this particular game, I would also recommend that you <coughs> load stuff to memory uh, where, this, where, the, where the CPU would have C in the cartridge image and then let it copy. Because if you start interfering with the copy code, you're, you're likely going to do some mistakes and that would eventually make the ground, uh, your crack look like crap. Uh, but, but it's worth the extra effort on where the game has and built in dcruncher to throw that one out and never use that and, and do your own dcrunching, save that area to where it's supposed to be and allow your dcruncher to work efficiently and place it directly there. That would be my recommendation, but uh, you do like you want, and uh, yeah, it's this game takes a lot of patching because it loads a number of, of routines, um, and you need to patch all of them. And to be honest, the machine code here looks a bit weird because it's not written like in in native machine language. It's it's written in some sort of C-like code, and it has optimized a number of things into weirdness. Um, I should be able to show you a bit of that. All right, I don't know if you can see this, but uh, let's hope you can. Here it sets the bank to 05, and this is where it has a lot of font data. And then it set up, sets up a counter. It adds a thousand to the counter, that's the base of where the cartridge is, and then read a byte, push it to the stack, take the counter, add uh, F8 uh, 100, so <laughs> the, the very highest font bank, and then it uh, <laughs> stores to O2, so pulls the byte and then stores to O2. So you have a counter, it calculates the source address based on the counter and reads it. It calculates the destination pushes up the or pulls the the byte again and writes it no human would code like that that's that's not how you normally do it it's, it's this is something only a compiler would do and then the really weird stuff here is it's doing lda set carry and then isc so it it uses an illegal opcode to determine if the counter is done or not I guess this means that it should copy 0800 bytes. Uh, because uh, if you increase the the uh, the counter, the high byte of the counter, and that one is eight, this seemingly triggers if the <laughs> if the high byte of the counter is eight. 
yeah, again, I've never seen anyone do it like this before. It looks really weird. All right, so that was that. Um, that was describing how describing how to extract the data, and I how and how I approach having the ROM banks being converted into something that will load from disk. So that would be how to make like a disk version. And uh, a lot of, the, I mean, most of the work here, you need to find out yourself and apply the patch and get your like work process or workflow on how to do it. But uh, uh, I've, I've indicated to you a few of the like main strategic approaches I have applied here to make this work. Uh, but let's also assume that you want to make another version of this uh, something that's been running from a cartridge loads really fast and loading from disk means that it will eventually be slower and if you don't want it to be slower and you don't want it to be easy flash one of the options you have is is using a ram expansion unit so how would you retrofit this game to work in uh, a ram expansion unit uh, so what I have done before, uh, I've done uh, a, 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 an REU version of uh, Alternate Reality: The City. There, I packed all my files and I and I link them together into one big like IFFL file, um, and then first uh, when I started the game. I detected if there was a RAM expansion unit available. There are multiple versions, and uh, you can have that on Codebase 64. One of the things, or one of the approaches to that would be <coughs> copy uh, uh, like one page of memory to the RAM expansion unit, zero out the, uh, the area of memory, and then copy it back. Uh, if the, or, or, Let's let's take that back. You you place like one byte um, thirty three in a page of memory, and then you send that to uh, to the RAM expansion unit. You you put another byte like zero to that page of memory, and then you transfer it back. If you would have the first byte the 33, that means that the RAM expansion unit actually worked because then memory was sent and could then be retrieved. That can only happen. The retrieval part could only happen, or the retrieval part proves that the sending part also worked and there was additional memory that was addressed using the mechanisms for sending it. But if you find the other byte, the zero, that proved that something of that uh, transfer didn't work, which means that there is likely no RAM expansion unit available. I hope that was sort of clear, but th that is one of the approaches. There are mul multiple approaches and Codebase64 is going through uh, a few of those. And, uh, and I would recommend you to, to read up on a few of those if you would like to learn how to do that properly. Okay, the second part was having this big IFFL file, and I read that using my normal fast loader, and, and I built um, a table of the indexes of the segments of the IFFL file, and where a segment is uh, like the, the files that are in this bigger file. Uh, they, they were no longer files because they are segments inside the bigger file. And I built a table. This works pretty much like scanning does on uh, on an IFFL. Normally, when you have an IFFL, you have you shoot out a, a little routine into the into the um, disk drive memory that scans your IFFL file and builds a table on on the offset track sector and offset inside the sector for all the segments inside the IFFL file. I did basically the same when I copied the the IFFL file into the RAM expansion unit, and then I just had my uh, my standard D cruncher running, but rather than calling uh, the disk drive routine for for getting a byte from the disk drive, I was writing a, a little tiny piece of code that reads uh, an area from the RAM expansion un unit. So reading one byte from the RAM expansion unit. That's not the fastest way to do it, uh, because I was only reading one byte at the time, and, and given the overhead, uh, 
it wasn't even faster than like an easy flash or anything, even if uh, the the actual transfer could be faster. So, uh, but it's still sort of the cartridge feeling to that load. You could depack stuff into the RAM expansion unit, and then you could split the entire block of a file into into RAM. But uh, that's not how I did it. Uh, uh, it's a bit slower, but it's it's more convenient from my perspective to do it like I did it. So that's how I retrofitted uh, Alternate Reality the City into working from uh, a RAM expansion unit. And I just might do uh, Knights and Slimes also working from a RAM expansion unit. You never know. Let's see. I haven't done the disk version yet. I'm rather close, but uh, yeah. This thing called life that takes so much of your spare time. That's really bad. That is actually everything I wanted to discuss this week. I hope you enjoyed this deep dive into cartridges and cracking cartridges. And with the extra bonus of learning a bit about uh, RAM expansion unit and how they work. And how you could retrofit your games to be RAM expansion unit running. Uh, I should also mention that there is a RAM expansion unit video done by the 8-bit guy. Uh, I will have a link to that also down in the description if you want to see him going through the how the RAM expansion units work. Uh, as, as always, Dave has done a great job in exploring that and it's also graphically very nice. And uh, so he has a very cool touch when it comes to... Uh, describing things so that they are easily understandable. I could warmly recommend that as well. That was everything for this week. I hope I will be able to conclude another one by next week, but you never know. Bye bye!